gives me great pleasure this evening to invite Professor Matt Wright to give his inaugural lecture, Navigating the Wide Open Field. It is probably uh, a, a different form of lecture than perhaps we have ever received in the university, so enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Rama, um, and thank you all for being here. Um, many of you I know um, and have worked with for, for a very long time, so it means a real, um, it really does mean a lot to me that you're here, so thank you. Um, as Rama very kindly said and kind of opened the, the field for me, um, this will be a, 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 a hybrid, really, between uh, performance and demonstration of uh, my work and some theoretical aspects that underpin the work. But as you can see, I'm interested in hybrid forms. I'm interested in um, the navigation between different types of media and different types of presenting material. So I hope that will come across uh, this evening. Um, the, the lecture is called Navigating the Wide Open Field because I'm interested in the notion of uh, journeys and connecting points between very, very different types of ways of working. So I work as a composer with scores, um, but I also work in many forms of hybrid collaboration. So what I thought I would do is try to survey the horizon of uh, the work that I've done so far and some work that I'm doing uh, right now, and um, just try to touch the surface, really, of, of those different areas on that horizon. Um, I thought I'd do a, a sort of a journey, really. So the, the first journey is a navigation between the record collection, because that's where I started thinking about connecting different elements together. I was thinking about um, a background of uh, DJ culture, which is something that I um, was very prominent in my life when I was growing up at home, um, and the collision between that and my formal education. So navigating the the record collection is the first part of my talk, and then um, we're going to zoom right in to the technology that I have here um, to talk about navigating the time axis. I'll explain what that means later. Um, then we're going to zoom right out from the surface of the record to dealing with the, the internet and how I've been very influenced by um, the way that hypertext works in, in uh, website design and how that's influenced my music. So we've gone right up into the ether, and then um, we're going to go through uh, a website which is about Mongolia to Vietnam and a collaboration that I made there with uh, Vietnamese musicians. Uh, and then we're going to bring it back to this room, and I'm going to talk about the sound field in this room. So um, it is a hybrid um, uh, journey that we're going to be on, and um, uh, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, so, to begin with, the reason that I'm talking about navigation is that the, the term um, compose comes, has its roots in the word compagnia, which means to connect. Um, so, therefore, at the heart of composition is the sense in which you, the, there should be two or more points which are brought together in a composition, a musical composition. The, the fact that the two points are being brought together means that there must be some sense of movement from one uh, position to another, a navigation from one point to another in order to connect. Now that movement, that navigation might be aesthetic, it might be geographic, um, it might be linguistic, um, but the, the essential idea that a composer is somebody who connects is a crucial part of my belief really as a composer. So therefore, um, composers that talk a lot about style, um, for me, I'm interested in thinking slightly beyond style because I think a, a composer is somebody that tries to think about uh, stylistic features but tries to connect things together. So for me, um, composition is inherently about navigating. Um, this idea about navigating... Um, technology and navigating acoustic composition is something that was crucial in the 20th century. Um, so I'm just going to scroll back a little bit to um, a very famous composer, Jonathan Harvey, who said at the end of the 20th century that 
the next century will bring a profound interaction or war between information technology and the poetic mind. It will surely be in music that one of the crucial battles will be fought. The upshot will be reconciliation at a new level, reconciliation transcending duality. And an alternative take on that notion that two surfaces, two ways of working should be brought together is the notion that we can think about nodes and think about networks and think about simultaneous things existing in the same moment rather than being brought together in the traditional classical dialectic um, uh, way of constructing an argument. And that uh, notion comes from George Landau, who's a hypertext theorist, somebody who was thinking about how websites were changing reading. If you all think about the way that we read um, when we use the internet, of course, we're reading certain words, and those words are gateways, they're portals, doors, into new pages, and we are navigating our way through that text. That's a very different way, of course, to reading from left to right, as we would do with a traditional book. So this notion of navigating nodes and networks was something that George Landown was talking about in the early 1990s when he said, we must abandon conceptual systems founded upon centre, margin, hierarchy and linearity and replace them with ones of multilinearity, nodes, links and networks. So this notion of very uh, complex networking of uh, linking ideas together is something that I'm, I'm really very much interested in. So um, the, the notion of navigating the record collection, that's where I began uh, thinking about music um, when I was very, very young. I was lucky enough to have... Um, a family that were not themselves musicians but loved music and um, all kinds of records were in my family's uh, background and my, my brother and sister had a, a very interesting record collection of very, very diverse things. And I actually never really considered one linear path of musical history. So this idea of nodes and networks for me feels something uh, very natural to me. I learned musical history through formal education, but informally, I learned the idea that all kinds of musics could be connected. Um, just to give you a, a flavour of the sorts of things I was listening to when I was growing up, there was um, quite a, uh, a collision of many different kinds of styles. I'm just going to play you an example of a few. Okay, so that's uh, something that R. Murray Schaefer would call... Um, a surrealistic juxtaposition. He said that the 20th century has given us the ability to dislocate sounds in time as well as in space. A record collection may contain items from widely diverse cultures and historical periods in what would seem to a person from any other century but our own an unnatural and surrealistic juxtaposition. That's the kind of soundtrack I grew up with, a collision of very many different kinds of um, musical identities and so that might explain why there are so many layers uh, to the, my music um, and why it may seem in which the, the, the languages and the different techniques that are used don't necessarily resolve. I'm interested in the tensions and the collisions of those surfaces and I'll come back to the idea of music as a surface later in the lecture. There's something, um, of course, natural about using this technology in front of me um, for the idea of navigation. I've got in front of me a, a conventional DJ setup. For those of you that, uh, that know me, you know that I have a, a background as a DJ as well as a, a, a classically trained composer. And this technology allows us to place musical surfaces next to each other. So, for instance, I have a vinyl recording here and I have a laptop, and I have a mixer in the middle which is designed to bring those two musical identities together to generate a third sound. This part of the technology here called the crossfader is a kind of navigable tool 
where you can create arguments between the two surfaces, almost like a, a conventional dialectic, you might say, in, in an essay. Um, but of course, the, the, the practice of mixing together two or more musical arguments is one that I would call multilinear. It doesn't necessarily go in a, in a very clean direction which leads to an assimilation. It may lead to moments where there are really interesting moments of tension and colliding um, uh, moments of decentered argument. And I'll come back to the notion of decentered argument later. So DJ technology is fundamentally interested in the idea of um, navigating between surfaces. Now, in music, that's not actually uh, a, a particularly new idea. I'm just going to play you something um, that was published in 1714. Now, what we actually heard there was a beautiful fragment, as you can see, um, by Corelli, famous uh, Baroque composer, the Concerto Grosso No. 4 in D major, as I said, published in, in 1714. What you may not have realized is that you heard the same music twice there. Um, there was a, a use of what's called a repeat mark, which is where musicians are told to get to a certain point within a timeline and then to snap back to the beginning of a certain section of that music and play that music again. Now, that essentially treats music as a kind of surface. It suggests that there's a, a line in which you can navigate to a new point or an old point in this case and go back to it and hear that music again. So I'm fundamentally interested in this notion of navigating the timeline or navigating what's called the time axis. And I'll come back to that in a second. As I say, it's not a particularly uh, new thing. We have, um, of course, in pop music, we have um, many, 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 many examples of repetition being celebrated in the same way. I'm re really interested in this fragment um, from the Beatles at the end of Hey Jude, one of the most famous examples of musical repetition. And I'd suggest that the repetition at the end of Hey Jude um, takes us from an almost linear musical experience where we're following the progression of the song to a moment that is navigating from one point back to another and so on, like this, to create almost a vertical listening experience. The, the euphoria of this music is created by the tension between moving from one point in the music back to an earlier point, running up to a same point and running back again and adding layers upon layers upon layers on top of that. This is why I didn't wear the lime green suit this evening, because uh, Ringo beat me to it. Um, there's a fantastic euphoric moment of, of musical repetition, of course. Now, as, as I said, we're dealing with a, um, a kind of repetition which fixes a point in the past, and we navigate back to that point in the past. Now, um, the turntable as a technology is incredibly interesting because it's one of the only recording media where it's possible to navigate in other ways across the, the musical timeline. What a, a vinyl record actually is, is it, it solidifies time as a surface. So it, it's the perfect medium for uh, navigating from the chronological to the physical. I can see every point on this timeline, and I don't have to follow the traditional syntax of the musical recording. I can place this needle anywhere on the record and generate my own timeline. Um, of course, with CDs, you can't really do that. It's hidden away. Um, with MP3s that we play through the internet, also it's relatively unusual um, to be able to do that because you can't see the time as a surface. Now, this is fundamentally important to me. This is why I'm still playing uh, uh, records and my students think I'm crazy um, because it's a navigable surface. Um, just to give you um, a, a sort of background to this, this is something that Friedrich Kittler would call the time axis and specifically he would talk about the gramophone as being a fantastic example of um, time axis manipulation and that time axis manipulation is the fundamental technique 
that we get in DJ culture and um, musical experiments in the 20th century and onwards. So Robert Warby, the uh, composer and broadcaster, says that when a sound is recorded, the recording medium has the effect of transforming the sound into a physical thing. A few centimetres of tape, a series of grooves on a phonograph disc, magnetic patterns on a hard disc, etched patterns on an optical disc or whatever. Manipulation of the recording medium, cutting, splicing, speeding up, slowing down, reversing direction of travel, etc., causes changes in the sound. In this way, sound can be treated as though it really is physical stuff, almost as if it did have a tactile physical form like clay or paint. So this notion that you can move through the timeline is something I'm going to demonstrate now um, with a record that uh, many of you may um, be very um, familiar with. So you might recognise that as um, a very famous part of the James Bond soundtrack from 1971, Diamonds Are Forever, with lyrics by Don Black and arranged um, by John Barry. The interesting thing about, of course, working with a turntable is that you could hear that entire timeline backwards. and all kinds of mixtures in between. So, um, in the spirit of a diamond, I thought I'd try and create a time diamond, which is um, to isolate certain parts of that recording um, and just navigate through the timeline um, in a multilinear way. So not always just repeating in the sense that we saw in the Corelli, but picking various points on the timeline and navigating through it. Through it. hope that Shirley Bassey will um, <laughs> forgive me for, um, for the, uh, possibly the, the, the uh, gender transition there. There's a very interesting article about plunder phonics, which is a, a technique um, by a Canadian composer called John Oswald, and he works with all kinds of Dolly Parton recordings, changing the, the vocal tonality uh, to, to suggest this, this beautiful transition from male to female to other kinds of genders and so on. And it's a, I think th this is a, a great example, so I hope uh, Shirley will, will forgive me. Um, this notion of being able to move through the timeline, of, of being able to think about time as a surface, is something that I think is fundamentally interesting about hypertext, if we go back to thinking about text in websites. And I started uh, in the mid-noughties to become a little bit obsessed, if I'm honest, with the way in which uh, website design could change the way that we think about music. Um, and one of the things that uh, really lit me up was learning about how to code websites. And I started to think about coding, um, working with computers and programming computers, almost as a kind of composition. Um, 
And one of the very first uh, uh, little experiments I did with that was with that was in 2008, um, and I was asked to work with Hazel Stone, the fantastic Hazel Stone at the Sydney Cooper Gallery, um, to make an installation. And I had an open brief, and so I thought what I would do is record um, field recordings, zones of Canterbury, so that people could come into the gallery but they could navigate through websites made from sound captured in Canterbury. That sounds all very convoluted, but um, I hope this makes sense. Um, what I'm going to show you is a, a website that was projected onto the wall of the Sydney Cooper Gallery, and the audience could come through and move through different squares on the website, and that would trigger sound, um, and when they click, as I'm going to click here, it will go to a new zone of the city. And the idea was to have a, a recording of the city, but not a duplicate of the city. It was to think of making a digital version of the city, which was navigable in a, in a very interesting way, so that you could dart from, say, St Dunstan's to right by the cathedral to out to Thannington to into Dane John in a split second. Um, and so this was called transference. A recording of um, the Dane John with the sounds of the ring road just, just beyond. This was actually before Augustine House was opened, so I'm showing my age here. But uh, the, what you see here is a, is a website, but for me I can think of, about this website in a similar way to a record. Um, by navigating across the surface of the website I can navigate to a new zone of the city. here is a, a website um, that could actually represent any city, um, but it represents Canterbury right now. But I'm interested in this notion of navigating the, the physical <coughs> and navigating the virtual, and that was my first experiment in thinking about how sound could be a navigable form. I became uh, really, really interested in how could you represent uh, that kind of way of working with sound because of course conventional musical scores that we traditionally read from left to right can't capture that sense of freedom in the same way. There is a whole history of what's called open form musical <coughs> composition where the musicians and the audience can move through different zones of, of the composition but still it's a paper based uh, form and I thought I, I would try as much as possible to think about um, how that timeline might look because if I could understand how the timeline might look then I could start to develop other ways of working with the technology and thinking about how that might be actually interesting for musicianship and not just a kind of theoretical idea. So um, this is a little sketch that I made for um, a, a, a website about Leonardo da Vinci which um, I'm actually going to work on a, in a couple of weeks time in this very space with a, with a Spanish percussionist and this is the kind of map of the website um, so you can see that it looks very different to the conventional idea of reading where you would read from left to right here um, the musician goes through a series of stages in the music and then there are all kinds of potential paths that they can take um, and I'm really interested in that notion that a piece of music could have multiple outcomes 
Uh, a, a text that seems to capture that again comes from George Landau, our hypertext theorist that I'm relying a lot on this evening. He says, uh, one of the fundamental characteristics of hypertext is that it is composed of bodies of linked text that have no primary access of organization. In other words, the metatext or document set, the entity that describes what in print technology is the book, work, or single text, has no center. One experiences hypertext as an infinitely decentrable and recentrable system, in part because hypertext transforms a document that has more than one link into a transient center, a directory document that one can employ to orient oneself and to decide where to go next. So where did I go next? Well, I um, started to think about the possibilities of this technology in relation to installation work. And some of the images that you'll see on the screens here, they document um, the, not just the musical events, but the, all of the journeys, the navigation between the different events. Um, so there are rehearsal situations, there are performances, concerts, installations, and so on. But crucially, I also took photos on all of those journeys. And one of the most important and life-changing journeys uh, for me was in 2009, uh, I had a very strange experience. I learned that I was going to be commissioned by a, a festival in New York to create a, a sound installation for a nightclub in Greenwich Village. But the, the next week, I was in the middle of the Gobi Desert with my wife visiting her, her mother, who was living in Mongolia. And this uh, very strange situation resulted in a piece for the um, New York Festival, the Matter Festival. Um, I'll just give you an example of the website that I created for that piece. The interesting thing about the um, whole journey for us was that we spent uh, 10 days driving through the Gobi Desert in a, in a jeep and at certain points I was asked to get out of the jeep and look around and I saw an incredibly flat horizon for at least 800 miles in every single direction. And when you drive in a jeep um, at say 70 miles an hour across a surface like that um, you see no uh, sensation of speed. You lose. You have a very, very different sense of speed. Um, I actually started to think because we'd been driving at this speed for so long. I actually started to almost slightly hallucinate because it was very hot and it's very, very extreme conditions. And I thought that it actually it was very much like driving across the surface of a record. It was incredibly dusty. There were skeletons. Uh, possibly ghosts, and of course, m most of the people in my record collection have already died, so I'm, al I'm already collaborating with ghosts in a sense. <coughs> anyway, I'm glad, you, uh, I'm glad you're with me on the, uh, on the tangential link there, but <laughs> what, what I came up with um, was uh, a website uh, which is called Totem, um, and I'll come back to the word totem in a second, for uh, Gobi, New York. So Gobi, New York is a kind of hybrid space. It's both the Gobi Desert and New York because it, the, the one thing that you don't see in the middle of Manhattan is the horizon, of course. So the way that these, um, uh, the audience experienced this work was to walk in uh, from the centre of Manhattan or Greenwich Village into this nightclub called La Poisson Rouge and experience this website um, projected on, onto the walls. And again, they could navigate through... Um, the, the images on the screen. And some of them relate to um, my association between the, the, the very interesting um, fragile textures in the Gobi Desert and, for instance, the sounds of records. So by moving through this website, there are all kinds of fragments that I recorded. Um, we have Mongolian throat singing, we have field recordings, um, and the idea is essentially to update that idea of navigating across the timeline. Again, what we have here is a sense of hypertext, kind of informing the way that I would work as uh, a musician. 
So hopefully this has a, a little bit more sonic coherence. I'm going to just navigate through this website a little bit and there's an opportunity for all of you to navigate through this um, on the iPads uh, back in the central part of the theatre as well. Okay, so we've navigated through the record collection. We've uh, navigated from the, uh, across the axis, the time axis, um, across the surface of a record and navigated the, um, the space between the physical and the virtual. Um, the next part of the talk is essentially about the collaborative space, thinking about um, the notion of the way in which working with nodes and networks can create interesting hybrid spaces. This, um, this next um, project that I'm going to show you um, has a relationship to the project I just talked about, but is much more about real people performing, um, although albeit in a, in a strange uh, modified form. I, I was very lucky to receive one of those um, golden emails which w uh, said, um, we're interested in your work, would you like to fly to Hanoi in Vietnam and work with traditional Vietnamese folk musicians um, who are also very, very interested in technology and, by the way, they, they are actually the, the best folk musicians on their instruments in the world. And what do you say in that situation? I said, well, I have to see some students in a moment, but uh, after that, um, I, of course, I would love to. Um, and I wound up working on uh, this project called Inside Outside, which is a project um, that was initiated by a, a fantastic Vietnamese uh, musician called Tan Thuy. Um, Vietnam is, in a sense, having the 1960s that it never had in the sense that it is now becoming a, a, a real mecca for all kinds of interesting globalised approaches to music and fashion and technology and so on. And this particular project looked at gender in traditional Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese music because to be a woman um, learning a traditional folk music instrument in Vietnam is still to unfortunately be asked to perform in front of images of waterfalls, to dress in a certain costume, to learn a certain choreography, and to often mime in TV shows, um, essentially to co uh, cohere with an, a, an image of beauty in, in Vietnamese eyes. So Tan Thuy actually took this notion and really twisted it on its head. So she made a gesture analysis of all of the gestures that Vietnamese women were taught when they work in TV shows, and said that she wanted to make an installation where these traditional women would be placed in boxes as if they were objects in a, in a museum, almost suggesting that they are museum pieces. Um, and we worked with a fantastic Swedish choreographer, Mary Fallin, to make a, a dialogue between inside and outside. Uh, we made a, a choreography based on these uh, visual gestures so I'm just going to show you a little uh, video of this collaborative um, composition that we made.
So what we have there is an example of a, um, a work that, that for me, um, really raises questions about the collaborative space, Na how, how to navigate the, the collaborative cultural space. And I think one way uh, in which to kind of answer or think about in theoretical terms what that kind of collaboration might be like um, is, again, to go back to George Landau, um, <coughs> Who, who this time is actually quoting somebody else. He's um, quoting the Russian philosopher uh, Bakhtin when he says, um, the dialogic, the polyphonic, multivocal novel, which is constructed not as the whole of a single consciousness absorbing other consciousnesses as, as objects into itself, but as a form, a, a whole formed by the interaction of several consciousnesses, none of which entirely becomes an object for the other. So this idea of the dialogic is something that comes from being able to navigate these different spaces. It allows for difference to be heard and for there to be texture in this difference. So that's something I'm fundamentally interested in in um, all of my work. So um, having gone through all of these different spaces, I'm finally going to bring it back to this room um, and talk about navigating the sound field in this particular space. Now, the, the notion of linking dialogic thinking and sound um, is again not a new idea. Um, uh, a lecture from 1938 uh, gave Edgar Varese, a very famous 20th century composer, the chance to talk about um, acoustical arrangements that would allow for zones of intensities and that these zones would appear of different colours and of different magnitude in different perspectives for our perception like the different colours on a map. So this particular room has surround sound um, available in the space, meaning that sounds are available from in front of you but also behind you, and it's possible to make zones of intensities in this particular space. So to give you a practical example of a project that uses this idea of navigation, I'm going to finish by just showing you a... Um, project called Transmap, which was made with the uh, world-leading um, saxophonist Evan Parker. Some of you um, saw uh, me perform with him in this space and have very kindly come to lots of our shows. Um, I'm going to show you a, a, a very, very simple version of um, what I would call an instrument. Um, it's a piece of software called Ableton Live that DJs traditionally use to loop together musical fragments, just as I showed you earlier. But I have um, worked with Evan Parker to make a CD project that we recorded at the Broadstairs and the Canterbury campuses and have colour-coded sounds into zones of intensities, as, as Verez would say. Um, so we have here zones of saxophone sound. Here's a, a, a recording of Evan Parker trying to sound like an insect. I'll, uh, I'll come back to why he's doing that in a second. The reason he's doing that is because there are actually insect sounds in this uh, recording as well. So these are cicadas. And then um, key click sounds that come from the sound of the saxophone keys, not the actual pitches, but the, the finger movements. And then long tones made from saxophone sounds that have been manipulated in time and stretched to much longer than their original length. And it's possible for me to navigate through these different sounds. So what I thought I would do is just finish um, 
by saying that this project that is ongoing with Evan Parker is in a sense not really a composition, it's a language. Um, it's a language which is inherently built on navigation, on the ability to be able to move through the timeline. Um, this began with Evan Parker's record collection, so in a sense it loops back to the beginning of this lecture in the notion that my way of thinking began by thinking about navigating through records, um, but moved through working with websites uh, to the collaborative space and now to the space in the room. So I'm just going to play a little example of that, finishing um, by navigating through the timeline of a drum sample to show you the potentials of this fantastic space. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say one thing, if I may. Um, in a time of tremendous fragmentation, a time literally of profound interaction or war, of closing borders, a time when the phrase network is often framed in the negative, as in terrorist network, we need to remember the tremendous importance and cultural vitality of nodes and networks, networks that are too dynamic to map, too diverse and thrillingly complex to be dragged down by the borders of geography and statehood. On this day of all days, whilst we argue about whether to leave or to remain, artists are busy at their work, and through their work they make new forms of social fabric, of dynamically shifting connectedness. Through their agreements and tensions that they place in their work, they test the notion of cohesion, they give democracy texture. Thank you.